Chapter 9, Patterns of Inheritance. Genetics is the science of heredity. These black lab puppies are purebred. Their parents and grandparents were black labs with very similar genetic makeups. We talked about this a little bit in Chapter 8, but purebreds often suffer serious genetic defects because they are so incredibly inbred to keep the bloodlines what they consider clean or fresh. So there's a chance, more of a chance of mixing bad genes together. The parents of these puppies were a mixture of different breeds. So their behavior and appearance is more varied because of their very diverse genetic inheritance. The science of heredity dates back to ancient attempts at selective breeding until the 20th century, a lot of biologists actually believed that characteristics acquired during life could be passed on. Characteristics of both parents blended irreversibly in their offspring. This is what we know now. Now this, what we mean by this is an example that biologists used to believe that if you learned to play the violin beautifully, that just because you learned it, if you had a baby, your baby would come out already knowing how to play and do wonderfully at the violin, which we know is not at all true. We could have a genetic predisposition to being musical, but just because our parents body, you know, spent time bodybuilding and became huge like Arnold Schwarzenegger does not mean that when we're born, we're also going to look the same way. So characteristics that your parents acquire aren't necessarily going to pass on to you. Characteristics of both of your parents blend in the offspring and you are exactly half mom and half dad genetically, even if you look a little more like one or the other. Modern genetics began with Gregor Mendel, who was a monk. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, he had a lot of time on his hands, so, he started experimenting with pea plants. Okay, and this is a pea plant here. You can see a purple petal, and we've got some male and female plant parts right here. And he knew a little bit about plants, so he was able to use these pea plants to start trying to determine how heredity worked. And what he did was he actually crossed pea plants that contained certain different characteristics and tried to trace the traits from generation to generation. This illustration here shows his technique for cross fertilization. So what he did was he took two plants that looked different from each other. So here we have a purple one and here we have a white one. And in the middle of these plants we can see some little, um, they look like little, almost like little fibers with a yellow cap on the top. That's the male part of the plant that contains pollen. And pollen, um, well, less delicately, is just plant sperm, essentially, is what that is. And this green object in the middle is the female part. So what he did was he actually got a paintbrush and he dusted some pollen off of the white plant and fertilized the purple plant with that pollen by putting it on the female part. Okay, so that's called cross-pollination or cross-fertilization. He took a white and a purple plant, he crossed them, and he developed those pea pods into the offspring plants. And what color are the offspring plants? They're all purple. So what does this tell us? Which gene is dominant, purple or white? obviously purple because we see it in the offspring, okay? So he started doing this where he mixed together purple and white or red and white or red and blue and he tried to see which genes were dominant, which genes were recessive, or which genes don't show up as readily. So I've got a few genetics definitions here for you and as I usually tell you, it would be a good idea to pause the video and write down these definitions um, I'm not going to leave time in the video for you to write them down, so that's why you're going to need to pause them. I'm going to go now directly into discussing these definitions with you. Phenotype 
is your expressed or physical trait. This is what you look like. Genotype is your genetic makeup. This is what your genes are. Hybrid is an offspring of two different varieties. The P generation is the parental generation. F1 generation are the offspring. F2 is the next generation after that. Alleles are different forms of genes. A dominant gene is fully expressed. Recessive is not fully expressed. Homozygous is two different genes. Or excuse me, homozygous is two of the same gene. Heterozygous is two different genes and a test cross is a mating between an individual of unknown genotype and a homozygous same recessive individual. So in our picture here after we now have those definitions which be sure in pausing the video you wrote them down but you also should try to read through them and have a basic understanding because the rest of the chapter I'm going to use those terms and expect you to know what exactly I'm talking about. So here we have the P generation, which are the parents, and the generation born of the P generation is the F1 generation, which are the offspring. So what if the offspring had more offspring, what we call that, the F2 generation? Mendel studied several different characteristics, seven in total, seven different P characteristics. And he hypothesized, remember that means educated guess, he hypothesized that there were alternate forms of genes, which were called alleles, okay, alternate forms of genes, though he did not use the term gene at that point. The units that determine heredity, so a gene is the unit that determines heredity. From his experiments, Mendel actually deduced that an organism has two genes for each inherited characteristic. One characteristic comes from each parent. So if your dad has brown eyes and your mom has blue eyes, you carry both of those genes. You carry a blue-eyed gene and you carry a brown-eyed gene. Now, which one you actually express is dependent upon which of your parents' genes were more dominant. So if you have brown eyes like your dad, then you may have brown eyes, but you also are carrying your mom's blue-eyed gene. So we have two genes for every single feature in our bodies, one from mom and one from dad. So here's an example of another one of Mendel's, Mendel's um, experiments, we have the P generation, these are the parents. We have a purple flower mixed with a white flower, okay? And all of the offspring of that mix were purple. All plants have purple flowers in the F1 generation. So what does that tell us? It tells us that purple is dominant. But remember, that even though we may look more like a certain parent, we still have the other parent's genes that we're carrying. So if the F1 generation, if the offspring have their own offspring, which would be the F2 generation, notice we have three purple offspring and one white. So even though the parent in this situation was purple, it still passed on a white gene that it got from its mother in this situation, okay? So this tells us that purple is dominant, but it's still possible to pass on white. The offspring of a test cross often reveals the genotype of an individual when it is unknown. We're gonna come back to this slide. We're gonna start by first looking at what we call a Punnett square, a Punnett square, okay? And a Punnett square is spelled P-U-N-N-E-T-T, -T, a Punnett square. And this is a little square that geneticists use to try to guess or hypothesize 
what the children or offspring of two parents that are mixed together will come out with. Okay, so this is Punnett square number one. And what we're doing here is I'm giving you a sample of genes from mom and a sample of genes from dad. And we're going to call this, we're going to call these genes that represent eye color. Okay, big B represents brown eyes. Okay, and the reason that the B is big is because it's a dominant gene. Whenever we write dominant genes, we always write them in capital letters. So if we have a big letter like this one, a capital letter, this is a dominant gene. So brown eyes are dominant. Whenever we write little b like this, this represents recessive. Okay, And recessive is a gene that is less likely to be expressed. Okay. Recessive in this instance is for blue eyes. Okay, so the little b represents blue eyes. The big b represents brown eyes. Okay, so let's do a t let's do a Punnett square. So this is the male symbol. So this is dad's genes. Dad has a big b and a big b for brown eyes. Dad has brown eyes, and these are his genes: big b, big b. Mom has brown eyes too, so she has a big b and a big B, okay? So what we're doing here is we're making a test cross, okay? So what we do is we write dad gene, dad's genes up at the top and mom's genes over here to the side. And what we're gonna do is cross these genes to see what the children might be like, okay? So what we do is we just meet these in the middle. We bring a big B down from dad and a big B over from mom. So this is what one child might have, two big B's, okay, and we do this again for another child. Big B comes down, little B comes across, so we've got another child that could have a big B, big B, okay. We drop this one down and meet this one across, another child with a big B, big B. We drop this one down and bring this one across, big B, big B. So we looked at possibilities for four different matings, and all four of them have the same genotype, which is the same genes, okay? Now we know that the big B is for brown eyes, and the little B is for blue eyes. Well, we didn't have any little Bs here. So big B, big B means that this child is gonna have what color eyes? Brown. What about this child? Brown, 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 because they're all dominant genes for brown. So our percentage chance of having a child with brown eyes is what? 100% chance of having a child with brown eyes. Now one of the definitions you wrote down, we should point out here, if we have two genes that are the same, what do we call that? Homozygous. And this specifically is homozygous dominant because we have two big dominant genes, okay? So let's try mixing some different parents together. So in this one, dad has brown eyes. Again, he has a big B for brown and a little b for blue, okay? So he's carrying a blue eye gene but he doesn't have blue eyes because he's got the dominant gene for brown and dominant usually always wins over recessive. So dad has brown eyes but he carries a blue eyed gene so we've got a big B and a little b. Mom has brown eyes too. She has a big B and a big B for brown so she is homozygous dominant. Okay, so let's cross these and see what the children might be like. So we drop one down drop the big B down from dad and bring the big B across from mom. So this child, chance of being brown eyed is pretty good because that's big B, big B, which stands for brown eyes. Okay, so we'll bring one down from dad and bring one across from mom. So now we have big B, little B. We'll do the same thing here. Big B, big B. And the same thing here, big B, little B. Okay. So what color eyes is this child going to have? Brown. What about this one? This one has 
a dominant gene for brown and a recessive gene for blue. Well, who always wins? Dominant. So this child will also have brown eyes, but he will be carrying a blue eye gene. This child will have brown eyes, and this child will have brown eyes. So what's our percentage chance of a child having brown eyes? 100% chance. Now we said before that having two genes that are the same, homozygous, this is homozygous dominant. What about two genes that are different? Heterozygous, heterozygous, okay? So let's try mixing a different kind of parent here, okay? So here we have dad. Dad has a big B and a little b, brown eye gene and a blue eye gene. Remember, brown is dominant, so this is dad's genotype, but because he has a dominant brown eye gene, dad has brown eyes. Mom has a big B and a small b for blue, so she also has brown eyes. Okay, so we have a brown-eyed mom and a brown-eyed dad, uh, both of which are carrying a blue-eyed gene. So let's mix these guys together, okay? So big B, big B, big B, little B, big B, little B, little B, little B, okay? So what color eyes will this child have? Brown. What about this one? Brown. And this one? Brown. But what about this one? Blue. Here's our first blue-eyed baby. Okay? So, <clears throat> if this is homozygous dominant, then what do we call this? Homozygous recessive. Same genes, but they're recessive. So what's our chance percentage-wise, of having a child with brown eyes? 75% chance, or 3 out of 4. What's our chance of having a baby with blue eyes? 25% chance, or 1 out of 4. So let's look at another example, our, our fourth and final, okay? So in this example, we have a dad with blue eyes. Little b, little b, so he has blue eyes. Mom has brown eyes, big b, little b, okay? But she carries a blue eyed gene. So let's do the mix here, okay? Big b, little b, big b, little b, little b, little b, and little b, little b, okay? So what color eyes will this child have? Brown, brown, blue, blue. So what's our chance of having a child with blue eyes? 50%. What's our chance of having a child with brown eyes? 50%, or a two out of four chance. The inheritance of many human traits follows Mendel's principles and the rules of probability. Now there are some things we know for sure are dominant and recessive. For example, freckles are dominant. If you have a parent that has freckles, then there's a pretty good chance you will too. It's recessive to not have freckles. It's dominant to have a widow's peak. And it's actually recessive to have a straight hairline. Earlobe. If your earlobe is detached, like we can see here, a free earlobe, that's dominant, and an attached earlobe is recessive. Most disorders are caused by autosomal recessive alleles, and this is actually a really good thing. Um, <clears throat> Most disorders are caused by recessive genes, which is good because if they were caused by dominant genes, then anybody who received a dominant gene would also receive the disease. But if we receive a recessive gene for a disease, we can carry the disease, but we don't necessarily have the disease. So this, this kind of keeps things a little bit safe um, as far as passing on diseases. Here's an example. This is deafness, okay? 
So the gene for normal hearing is big D, and the gene for deafness is little d, a recessive gene, okay? So mom has a big D and a little d, meaning she's a carrier for deafness, but she's not deaf. Dad is also a carrier for deafness, but he's not deaf. So we're doing a Punnett square here. Now this Punnett square is kind of turned like a diamond, but it's the same kind of Punnett square we did on the last four slides, okay? So here's dad's genes over here, big D, little d. And there's mom's genes over here, big D, little d, okay? So let's mix big D, big D, big D, little d, big D, little d, little d, little d, okay? So what is the chance of these two having a child with normal hearing? Normal hearing, normal hearing, normal hearing. So it's a three out of four chance that they're going to have a child with normal, normal hearing, but a one-fourth or one out of four chance they'll have a child that's deaf. So the child must receive a recessive gene from both parents in order to be deaf, which would make it harder to pass deafness on because you have to receive it from both parents, which is much less likely. There's, there are a few disorders that are caused by dominant genes. Um, and an example of this is achondroplasia and also Huntington's disease. Um, achondroplasia is a, twipe, a type of dwarfism. And dwarfism is actually, um, <clears throat> there are many types of dwarfism, but this particular type, achondroplasia, is when the head and the torso are pretty normal in size, but the arms and legs are quite short. And this is caused by a dominant gene. So if one parent has it, then it's very likely that the children or child will have it. Also, Huntington's disease. Um, this is a degeneration of the nervous system. And this is also a, a dominant gene. So if one parent has it, it is, it is likely that a child, it would be passed to the child. Here are some other um, autosomal disorders in humans. This means um, these, are, these are diseases that are caused by recessive genes, so they're not as likely to happen. Um, you'd have to receive it from both parents. Um, albinism, being an albino. Cystic fibrosis, which is a um, disease of the lungs that causes excess mucus. Galactosemia, um, which can cause mental retardation. Uh, phenylketonuria, which is you're actually tested for at birth. This is one of the things when they prick your heel as a newborn and test your blood, they're checking for this, the PKU. Um, this can cause mental retardation. Sickle cell disease, which is a blood disease. Um, Tay-Sachs disease, where fat accumulates in the brain. It can cause mental deficiency and blindness. These are all recessive. You have to receive the gene from both parents. Dominant disorders, um, achondroplasia, Huntington's, we covered that. Alzheimer's disease, this is one type, is actually a dominant trait. And hypercholesterolemia, this is when we have high cholesterol, which can also be a genetic trait that is dominant. Karyotyping and biochemical tests can be done with fetal cells um, that can help people make reproductive decisions. Now, this is something that it's it's not as controversial as some other types of tests, but um, now women are given the option when they become pregnant to do all kinds of blood work and different tests to determine how healthy, um, get some percentages on how healthy their child might be once the child is born. Now, some, some people say that they don't care, they don't want to know, they don't want to have the test because it doesn't matter what, the, what issues the child has, they're going to have it have the child either way because they don't believe in, um, many people don't believe in abortion or, or ending the pregnancy. So many women choose to do it and many women don't choose to do it because they don't want to know because it won't change the outcome. But one of the things that they can do now is they can, they can take blood very early and, and tell you the likelihood of things like Down syndrome or cystic fibrosis or spina bifida, deformities of the spine. Um, or a more invasive way to do it is through amniocentesis, which is 
to insert a needle into the placenta and draw amniotic fluid up. And when the amniotic fluid is drawn up, within the amniotic fluid are fetal skin cells, skin cells from the fetus. And scientists can culture these skin, uh, skin cells or, or cells from the fetus and they can actually look at the DNA and the genes and give you percentages of the likelihood that there will be genetic problems in your child. Now, of course, there's some risk associated with puncturing the placenta. Um, we could introduce infection. We could also um, cause a tear or a leak in the placenta, but those things would be extremely rare. A less invasive method is ultrasound, which can, is done with sound waves. Um, and we just look through the belly at um, the fetus and we can look at physical features, hands, feet, um, we can see the heart, we can see the liver, we can see the kidneys a lot of times, the brain development, just kind of watch and keep track as things go along the pregnancy um, to make sure that everything's going okay. Now, of course, this is limited. We can't see genetic problems um, as clearly unless they cause physical deformities this way. Genetic testing can be of value to those that have a risk of developing a genetic disorder. So if, if a family knew that they carried deafness or they carried blindness or they carried cystic fibrosis, they might choose to have genetic testing to determine whether or not they want to have children um, to see how high the risk is for them to pass it on to their, their offspring. Dr. David Satcher was the former U.S. Surgeon General and he pioneered screening for sickle cell disease, which is a disease of the blood most common in African Americans and people of Italian or Eastern Indian descent that actually causes a deformity in the shape of blood cells that can lead to tissue and cell death. Very, very painful disease that has no cure. This concludes chapter nine of the genetic unit.